All right, thanks, Chairman. Um, I won't, I'll, I'll hit straight to the point. Um, first of all, I want to welcome my colleagues from Roscommon here um, in the Council. Um, right, um, Peter, you talked about incentives earlier on. Um, when you talk about incentives, are those incentives, because obviously, um, you know, money is one thing, and, and it for, say, regenerating, be it footpaths or making a town look well, but private property is owned by people. Are you talking about, say, tax incentives for people to live in certain areas? Say, the, the model of Lamas probably with Shannon Airport years ago, Farnock Airport that's in your own county. Are you talking about incentives like that that will bring people uh, to, to go back into the middle of towns? Second of all, and this is to any of you, and I know and you catered in a previous life in Galway, um, in planning and uh, on the planning end of it for people that there might be five pubs in a town, two that might be closed, um, and you want to turn them into something without going to um, all the hoops that's in planning. I know that there was um, legislation that was done here, um, and has that passed on right yet, or is there still bits of problems in implementing that to make it easy on what we call change of use, um, to live in over the shop, but if you want to live under the shop where the shop was, to keep it all going. Um, uh, Look, at Nulig talked about employment, and you're 100% right in that, in the line of, be it Boyle or um, other places that you've talked about. Um, look, at bed space is a problem in a lot of areas um, that, that around the country. Um, and to bring for tourism, you probably need more bed space. And is there incentives that you're talking about that's needed in that way? And that will kick on and give employment. Like, Peter, you'd have talked about 470 or 80 uh, towns over, I don't know, the four or 500 people there. Um, there's a lot of small villages as well that are, you know, if you're near a bigger town that hasn't housing now, the smaller village that was near it, people are renting in it now, which I've seen. And, and when you put a few quid into, and this is the nub of the issue, I believe, like I've seen the, the pride of place, like so Craig's was in it and that league was in it. And to see how a town can be sort of brought up. And I've seen, like the Craig's, that three new businesses has opened in it. Because at the end of the day, it's private people that will open businesses and give employment. Um, the one thing I'd say to the department, um, and I don't know whether you agree with this or not, and for all politicians and for, for probably council staff, um, there's an awful lot of different streams of funding. But it's nearly like going through a maze to know when is this coming and when is that coming. Is there any way we could do from January to December a calendar of the different schemes right through that we'd, we'd sort of know when everything is coming? Um, because there's voluntary people in a lot of those towns trying to do their best, helped on by their liaison with all the councils around the country. And these are people that are working every day in a lot of cases, and yes, they're liaison, but you need something if we could start at the beginning of the year and that be it the local representatives or be it the council or be it the department. All we'll hear is that something is announced, do you know what I mean? And then you have a window of opportunity of a month or two or three or four weeks. And what I'm asking the department, is there something we can do to help both the community and all the, the councils in the country that they'll say, well, this is coming in January, or we apply for this in January, this in February, because it's nearly like sort of a, an explosion that happens and your way you go and, you're, and you could miss out on something else if two different schemes. And I, like, we are hearing that a lot from uh, the ordinary, from people. Um, look, at, there's a lot of great work done in a lot of areas. Um, in my opinion, we have to give the incentives. I would be a believer that if you're living in rural Ireland, you should be getting a bigger tax break because, and the last question I have, and this would be probably aimed at Peter um, when you're the, with the county managers. Um, is there a danger that under the 2040 plan, when you look at the sort of the housing strategy and the emphasis on basically the larger urban area, 
or city, whichever you want to call it, um, that the smaller town would be could be left behind when you do the number crunching of the amount of houses that's aspired to or allowed in areas. Thanks. Thanks, Deputy. Um, we have a number of questions there, all sort of banged together, and they're addressed to, I suppose, across the board. Um, Senator Coffey and Deputy Smith came first there, and I suppose the town teams, town council, that particular question, I, I don't know, was it, was it Catherine made reference to that, or, or was it Peter? Um, um, the visual aid um, issue there in, in relation to Offaly. Um, there was also, um, Senator Coffey asked about uh, what will happen beyond this pilot. Um, what are the, the department's views in relation to that? Um, uh, one for maybe Peter in terms of the, the city and county managers and, and the councils indeed in relation to the responsibility not for buying property but it nearly has to be led by yourselves too and you have those powers. Um, you're looking at um, Senator Hopkins in relation to um, Indeed, the cost, the incentives there, what type of incentives she was asking would help. Um, Deputy Fitzmaurice has mentioned those as well. Um, uh, Senator uh, Hopkins also asked in relation to um, wh where, where to from here as well. Um, Deputy Fitzmaurice had very targeted questions there in relation to planning, some for Nullig, some from the department and some for Peter as well. So if we could try and not have any repetition and you take those questions up, maybe the department could, could start there with, with William. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> thanks very much, Chair. And, and actually, I might start with um, uh, Deputy Smith's questions. She asked how the towns were selected for the pilot. Um, so at the beginning of 2018, the minister established a steering group to examine what would be the most effective way to encourage increased residential occupancy in our towns and villages um, because you know, there were some schemes operated by the local authorities for example that hadn't generated uh, the levels of take up that were necessary to have any real effect. So the, the steering group and it included the Department of Housing and Planning, it included the Department of Public Expenditure and Reform, the Department of Finance and rep a representative from the CCMA. Uh, so the, the steering group suggested that the best way to proceed was through the development of a small number of, of well-planned pilot schemes that could be delivered relatively quickly uh, with the local authority working with the department and other agencies. So arising from, from that uh, process, the six towns that, that we have here today were identified. And they were identified really on the basis of a number of, of factors. First of all, we wanted to have um, some spread in terms of the, the size of the town, in terms of its population, but also in terms of the location of the towns. So you have towns represented here from the west, from the southeast, from the border region, from the midlands. So it's a mix of, of towns. Um, it's a mix of towns that we, we would have uh, worked with to some extent through our other schemes like the Town and Village Renewal Scheme. So to some extent it was building on uh, the, the Town and Village. Boyle would be a good example where, where they have their 2040 plan in place. Um, and they also, they were also towns that we knew had their own particular challenges. Uh, you know, that would enable us to test or to give them an opportunity uh, to identify um, the challenges and maybe solutions to overcoming those challenges. And again, a mix of towns in terms of historic uh, uh, towns, market towns, and towns that maybe would be attractive to, to tourists. Um, uh, uh, Deputy Smith also asked, um, uh, about replica replication and how we might achieve this. So the, the whole objective was to use these six towns um, as a pilot to identify what are the common threads, and I think we're hearing very clearly some of the common threads and, and, and themes that are coming through. Uh, and, and hopefully we will see solutions coming out of it as well. And we, we would hope to use uh, the, the learning from this pilot to, to help advise us 
when it comes to designing our, our, our schemes or our policies around town centre rejuvenation. Um, I might just say, and this, this touches a little bit on, on where do we go from here, which uh, Senator Hopkins raised amongst others. Um, the intention is that uh, a, a final composite report will be put together and we have commissioned somebody to help us uh, in relation to this. So by the end of the year, um, a draft composite report will be put together uh, and presented <coughs> to Minister Ring. Um, it will summarise all of the key issues uh, that, that we have heard today and more. It will also look at international experience to see if there are any learnings uh, from, from other countries that could be applicable here uh, in Ireland as well. Um, and, and certainly, if, if the committee had any particular inputs they, they would like to make to the department as well, arising from the hearing this week and last week, we'd be very happy to receive those. Um, Senator Coffey asked uh, if it's intended to extend the scheme. Um, ultimately, I suppose that's uh, the prerogative of the minister. But I think we're, we're, we're hearing a lot of similar themes here that are probably applicable right across the board. I think the important thing is, how do we actually take the learnings from this scheme? How do we help other towns to, to uh, for example, develop master plans, which was one of the, the strong messages I heard today, the importance of having a master plan, having stakeholder engagement. It's very interesting that, that um, in a number of these towns, they're looking at clusters of houses. Um, probably when we started off on this initiative, we thought it might be about single uh, properties that would be <coughs> renovated. But from our engagement uh, and from what we've heard today, it's really interesting to hear the potential for taking clusters of houses. So that's, a, an, important, uh, that's an important message and learning. So I, I, I think there's, there's an awful lot in here that will be very valuable. Um, the intention, the intention um, always was, and I said it in my opening remarks, that the Rural Regeneration and Development Fund uh, provides an opportunity for not just um, these towns but other towns to, uh, to come up with proposals and develop plans that can support town centre regeneration, including residential occupancy of vacant buildings. And in fact, in uh, the announcements which the Minister made just last week on the Rural Regeneration and Development Fund, it was quite interesting to see that there are a number of towns that, that are addressing um, vacant properties, vacant premises. Um, towns like Tulla, uh, Virginia and Loch Ray would, would come to mind, where they're actually taking a, a, a vacant property, maybe it was a, a, a public property, and trying to create civic space or trying to create um, a community-based um, attraction or facility. So, so I'm very encouraged to see that uh, not just these towns but other towns are, are, are kind of recognising um, that the Rural Regeneration and Development Fund is a vehicle that can provide multi-annual um, multi support for towns rather than simply uh, an, an annualised uh, pot of money. Um, <coughs> Senator Coffey also asked about philanthropic contributions and we, we very deliberately wrote into the RRDF uh, scheme um, the, the opportunity for philanthropic funds to contribute to um, the, the projects. I, I might just say that without naming any organisations, we have had conversations with a, a number of philanthropic organisations in relation to what the department is doing um, uh, to try and revitalise uh, rural towns. I know that some organisations have been involved in LEADER in the past in providing funding to the, the local development companies. Um, and we are, as a department, keen to try and explore the development of the philanthropic sector. Uh, we know there are organisations out there that are willing um, to contribute and have contributed. So it's something we're working on, uh, Senator, as well. Um, Senator Hopkins uh, asked about the local authorities and the extent to which they have been working together. <coughs> and the department has chaired a group 
um, involving all of the towns that are here today, and they've met quite regularly since this initiative was, was established last October. I think they've met on, on five or six occasions, including a workshop in September, a facilitated workshop that drew in a wider uh, group of, of, of interests, including, um, I think, some of the people that you might have met last, last week. So the local authorities have been working together and we will continue to try and facilitate um, an engagement you know, to take the lessons out of this. I, I, I think, Senator, um, your comment about employment is, is, is very apt and very important because I think what we've heard spread throughout the presentations that were made today is the need for a holistic approach here. So ultimately, if we're trying to renovate properties and encourage people to come back in uh, to the towns to live, there needs to be facilities in place, there needs to be employment. Um, and uh, again, we, we've heard that and I think Mary gave a good example of, of how um, Kilkenny County Council have, have used other funding like town and village uh, renewal funding to, to, to build up those type of facilities that can support families that might eventually move in, but that there are recreational spaces for them. Uh, but the employment piece is important as well. And uh, it's important to remember that, you know, schemes like the Rural Regeneration and Development Fund, the Town and Village Renewal Scheme, have placed a focus on, on, on stimulating economic activity in our rural towns as well. Um, and, you know, some practical examples of that would be that there has been quite a bit of investment has gone into digital hubs, enterprise hubs and food hubs through these different schemes. Um, and within the department, we, we, we do engage quite closely with the enterprise development agencies, with the likes of Enterprise Ireland, the local enterprise offices, um, and indeed IDA. And we're increasingly doing that. Um, the Atlantic Economic Corridor would be a good example of an initiative where we're all working quite closely together with a view to attracting um, investment in jobs. Uh, so so I, I think it's a very well-made point and it's important that we keep an eye on that. Apology, I have to leave the meeting because I'm chairing the next session in the Shannon, but if, I, if my questions could be answered, I will read them on the record later and I apologise to the witnesses if that's alright. There's nothing that's I can do. I've agreed to chair. Senator, thank you. Yeah, sorry about that, but I will read on the, on the responses to the questions I raised. Yeah. Yeah, um, Yes, sir. I was just going to finish up by, by answering. Uh, one there on the, and thanks for addressing what you did on the sort of the list down along of how we could help communities and councils. Yeah, I was going to just finish by, by answering um, th that question, Deputy. Uh, the, the, the Minister actually drew up a calendar of schemes at the start of this year and shared that with the local authorities and indeed he met with the, the uh, chief executives as well around that. Um, it, it seems that maybe we need to think about how we go a step further so that the local communities um, ha have early access to that calendar. But, but we do actually, we, we recognise the need even for the local authorities to be able to cope with uh, the different schemes that come throughout the year. So Is that list um, outlining all the different um, say the Department of Rural Affairs, every, when all their, uh, when the opening and the closing dates of all the different, um, say, funding models are in place, and it would have been possible, and um, this can go to the council as well, that the community groups everywhere would get that email sent to them everywhere, and at the moment it's the best horse jumps the fence after that. Yeah, it, it was exactly as you, you've outlined, uh, Deputy. It, it, it gave the, the yeah, an indicative good. of the month that's for good. each of the yeah. scheme. Um, and I think what we'll do is we'll, we'll talk with our colleagues in the CCMA to see how maybe that information can, can be filtered down. That's good. Thanks very much, William. I'll just call on Peter Hines now, please. Chairman, I, I'm sorry that Senator Coffey isn't here because I wanted to address his, his uh, question first, and that is the question about responsibility. To be on the record, Peter, so I, I understand he, as I said, that, he's, he's chairing I, the Senate. I, I, so. I did want to see yes. the colour of the eyes, um, and I, I, will, I will talk to him directly on it because I think, I think it's hugely important, really hugely important. Uh, the responsibility unequivocally for delivering on town and village renewal in our smaller towns and villages is a matter for the local authority, STAT. There is no question about that. We need departments, we need agencies, we need funding, we need a whole lot of people to be involved in it. 
but at the heel of the hunt, it is a matter for the local authority to deliver on. Uh, and, and we accept that and we absolutely prioritise. Some uh, have it higher on the list of priorities. It depends. Every county is different. Every um, local authority is different. And the priorities vary uh, across the, the local authorities. That's why they are independent authorities, as you well know. But the responsibility for delivering on town and village renewal is ours. We accept that, absolutely. Second point I would like to make, and I'll, I'll talk to uh, Senator Coffey directly on it, is there is a model in place. We are suggesting that there is enough learning done. This scheme is going to provide further learning um, and that we don't need to be looking outside the country or to other places <coughs> as much as we think that we do. And we would suggest from the CCMA that the elements that are essential to the model are, as I've put them up on the slide, and thank you uh, for facilitating putting it back up, community engagement at the start has to involve everyone in, the, in the, the town and village. There has to be a vision, a plan, whatever you call it. There has to be some notion of where we want to go, otherwise it's, it's just haphazard uh, opportunism. So there has to be a vision. There has to be investment, and that's the point I was making in the, new, uh, the, the Westport um, uh, description. Westport was transformed by the Seaside Resort Scheme. Seaside Resort Scheme gets a lot of bad press, and sometimes deservedly. But in the case of Westport, partly because the plan was there before the scheme came in, partly because we had uh, the, the engagement with the stakeholders, partly because we had uh, a very good town council, and I'll come to the question of town council in a second, uh, overseeing it, it transformed the place. Um, so that's about implementation, and it is about local authority leadership, and I think that's a common theme that should come across very clearly from all of the, uh, from all of the submissions. On the question of town councils, which I think was a question that was posed by uh, Senator Smith, um, it is obviously or so it's fairly clear that if you have a small number of councils where you have local representation and local uh, control and local um, resources, they are going to do better than if you have that spread. Having said that, we had three town councils. We have 30 towns that are of uh, magnitude. Um, Deputy Fitzmaurice talked about towns um, below 500. If you include everything from 250 up, you're talking about 800 settlements. And they're all important. Every one of them is important. Um, so the flip side of the uh, town council amalgamation into the uh, muni municipal district model is that more towns are getting a fair share of the cake. And places like Newport and Mulrani, in our case, and there are others around the country, are doing far better than they would have done uh, in, in the old system, and I think that's recognised as well. So there are, there, there are, are uh, uh, balances in it. Uh, on the question of the uh, setting up a, a, um, a central agency uh, or a centre of excellence, uh, there, wa there was a, a centre of excellence under the uh, MBA back in the 80s. It dealt with urban design. It was actually set up under the guidance or, or the, the, the first CEO was a guy called Derek Tynan. Um, and that worked very well for some time. I'm not quite sure why it moved on, but there's certainly an, a, a, a case to be made for having a centre of shared knowledge and a centre of shared expertise. I would strongly suggest, and we suggested that in the presentation, that that should reside in a public body or in a department. And um, there are uh, pluses and minuses in which department it should uh, or might sit in. Uh, the learning from this scheme might well influence uh, where it could or might sit. Um, but I would also strongly argue that there is a base level of skills required in every local authority to be able to deliver for all of those 400 or 800 settlements. <coughs> you can't, whether it's located in that loan uh, or Castlebar or Westport, as might be a contender, um, or in Dublin. You cannot have the whole of the country tripping to a place uh, for guidance. You must have the capacity to do some of your own. Uh, and that's about capacity building. Uh, I'm aware of time and I don't want to hog this, but I do want to just deal with some of the, the uh, questions that were put. Uh, on the question of incentives, uh, that is, uh, in our view, uh, and I think I speak for all local authorities, the question of incentives to guide investment back into the core of towns and villages is crucial. And 
I'm not the Department of Expenditure and Reform, uh, but I would guess that when you look at 800 settlements, 400 reasonably large, and the kind of investment that's needed, it is going to be very hard to find those resources uh, from the public purse. Uh, the only other option is some kind of, of a tax-driven um, private investment scheme. Uh, and I think that debate will be a big part of what comes out of the learning from, from the pilot scheme. Um, on the, the, the point that was made about uh, out-of-town shopping, uh, would we do it again? Perhaps we would do it differently. Um, and, but it wasn't all about planning. It is uh, the case that many t small towns and villages just can't accommodate the size of unit that cons consumers are, are demanding. Um, and in some towns, we've been successful in keeping that focus in the centre of town, uh, in others less so. But uh, I think the move to online shopping is going to change all of that radically anyway. Uh, and it may be that in the not too distant future we'll be looking to repurpose uh, edge of town big box shopping outlets because uh, of where Amazon, Google and the drone world have taken us. But that's maybe a question for an another day. Um, on the question of um, the arts and creativity, I think that's it extremely important point that we would all take on board. Not all cheap space is bad space. It is an advantage sometimes to have space that is slightly less used, slightly in less in demand, because it can accommodate um, you know, fringe activities and it can accommodate a, a, an arts uh, and creativity um, aspect to uh, towns and villages, which are really, really important. Um, on the question of dereliction, I think the point that was being made uh, when saying that it's not our responsibility to deal with dereliction is that it's not our responsibility to deal with all dereliction. Uh, and I think there is a balance. All of us, all, every local authority has used CPO and derelict sites legislation to facilitate either private development or to build our own developments, and a lot of that is housing. But we can't turn every town and village into a public housing dominated uh, town core, it just it, it won't work. Uh, so it is about balance, and I think that's the point that was being rather, raised rather than shirking, uh, shirking any, any responsibility. Uh, and finally, uh, to come back to the question of incentives, it is a question of grants, subsidies or supports, and they are limited and will be, uh, or tax breaks to try and uh, incentivise private development. And I think, uh, I think it was Senator uh, Hopkins talked about confidence. Confidence is a big part of it. That's why we talked about changing the narrative. Uh, and if you could get uh, you know, a, a, a grand design or a Dermot Bannon type programme around living in small town rural Ireland, which actually shows how good it is and can be, then I think that narrative might start to, to work as well. Uh, it has worked. You, play, you hear about Clonakilty, you hear about other places, um, and Kinsale, and, uh, that's the, but it is a 20-year programme as well. Uh, and uh, I think this is a very important step in it. We could go on for a very long time because it is a very big priority for local authorities.